This is NHTV2, North Haven Government Television, a service of North Haven Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of North Haven. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Frieda, North Haven's first selectman, and welcome to what is our first climate change forum here in North Haven. Over the course of the next hour to an hour and 15 minutes, we've put together a number of outstanding speakers to illustrate and to speak to all of us about what's happening across the country, in our regions, and in our municipalities. To give you some perspective, at a recent mayor's meeting, we as mayors and first selectmen were presented with a major issue that's occurring all across the United States and quite candidly all across the world, and that is climate change. We have been told that the average temperature has increased 1.5 Celsius degrees across the United States. And what we've seen, ladies and gentlemen, is what many of you have experienced, and that is the intensity of some of our storms here in North Haven. Over the course of the past few years here, we've seen tornadoes, hurricanes, major flooding, and in the last round of tremendous rainstorms, I was out with many of you in the streets of North Haven as we were viewing the damage that the intense rains have caused here in North Haven. So this forum today is designed to help all of us understand what's happening and what some of the solutions may be as we all move forward. It's my goal as your first selectman to help each and every one of you including those who have really been the victims of some major flooding in streets, in your homes, and in family rooms. We've got to do everything we can as a government, ladies and gentlemen, to help you to have hope that we can try to correct this for the future. So today, I'm joined by three very important people, and I'd like to formally introduce them to you. Our first speaker is Mr. Robert J. Klee with the Yale School of Environment on climate change and its impacts on Connecticut. Now, Rob and I had the pleasure of working with each other when he was the commissioner of DEEP, the Department of Energy Environment Protection. And Rob and I worked very closely in the early years, and we did a lot together. And Rob helped a lot of municipalities during that time. Our second speaker will be Mr. Moro Diaz Hernandez. Moro is with the Yale Center on Climate Change and Health Climate Change and Public Health in Connecticut. Both Rob and Moro have put together some very impressive and interesting presentations. And our final speaker this afternoon will be a member of our Clean Energy Task Force, a man who is the chairman of our Clean Energy Task Force, who for years has worked so closely with this office in an effort to do things like home energy audits, in addition to helping us improve our solar penetration here in the town, a man who's very passionate about climate change and clean energy, Mr. Kenny Foscue. Once again, Kenny is the chairman of our North Haven Clean Energy Task Force. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Rob Klee. Rob, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, First Selectman Frieda. Always great to see you. Really nice to be back here in North Haven uh, and to be here talking about all the things you've been doing. Uh, I know that'll come later, but uh, North Haven, I always use an example of uh, cities and towns that really got stuff done, and uh, a large part of that was because of you. Um, my role here this, uh, this afternoon is to introduce the concept of climate change and its impacts on Connecticut. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about the science here. That's part of my role now that I'm at the Yale School in the Environment, um, but with a focus on what's happening here in Connecticut. So without further ado, um, I will go into uh, my brief introduction on the greenhouse effect. And for many of you tuning in, you probably already know this, but greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like water vapor and carbon dioxide or methane, nitrogen 
nitrous oxides. They absorb heat energy and they re-emit that energy in all directions, including downwards, back towards Earth, keeping the Earth's surface and the lower atmosphere warm, which is generally a good thing until we add more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, primarily by burning fossil fuels or by cutting down forests or burning forests, as happens uh, often in the tropics. That enhances the greenhouse gas effect, making the Earth's surface and lower atmosphere even warmer, and that is what is called global warming. So fossil fuel combustion is a big part of the story and is part of our modern technological society in which we've released large amounts of carbon dioxide, one of our primary greenhouse gases. This is a graph from the, the National Oceans and Atmosphere Administrations, one of the key federal agencies that are collecting and analyzing data on climate change. And this looks back over 800,000 years using ice core, core data and other sources that show that CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels today, are higher than any point in the last 800,000 years. The last time they were this high was more than three million years ago when the temperatures were two to three degrees Celsius higher than today, and the sea levels were 15 to 25 meters, 50 to 80 feet higher than they are today. So you might be wondering who emits the most carbon dioxide? Well, the United States is second uh, behind China in annual CO2 emissions. Then the 28 countries that comprise the European Union, uh, India, Russia, Japan. The top three emitters around the globe contribute over 40% of the total greenhouse gas emissions, and the bottom 100 countries only contribute less than 4% of total emissions. The top 10, if we could figure out how to get all of them rowing in the same direction, collectively account for about two-thirds of the global CO2 emissions. But another way to look at this data is who has contributed most to the historical greenhouse gas emissions? And there, the United States and the European Union are first and second in historical emissions. And the United States alone is responsible for 25% of all the emissions of carbon dioxide that have happened uh, throughout our history. This uh, group, United States and the European Union, are almost responsible for half of all the historic emissions. Then, of course, we have the emerging economies in China and Russia and India, and Japan is also in that list as well. So let's bring it back to the United States briefly and talk about where the U.S. emits its greenhouse gases. And this is an inventory that we see goes back to the 1990s and the Clean Air Act amendments when we first really started tracking greenhouse gases in the United States. As you can see, carbon dioxide is over 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions, followed by methane, nitrous oxides, and fluorinated gases. The peak emissions were about 2005-2006, um, and what happened in 2008? Well, there was a recession, and that's actually part of why the emissions dipped then. But there's been active switching from coal to natural gas, which also accounts for our reductions in carbon dioxide emissions in the 2010s through today. Now, what sectors are most uh, impactful in greenhouse gas emissions? Well, it turns out nationally about 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity generation another 30% from transportation, 30% from building, heating, and cooling, and about 10% from agriculture. And that's rough, rounded numbers, but it's a good rule of thumb to think 30% electric, 30% transportation, 30% buildings, 10% other. Now, in Connecticut, our story is similar, though here our electric power sector is actually number two behind transportation. Transportation is almost 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions here in Connecticut. The residential and commercial sectors, the building, heating, and cooling, also make up a substantial amount of our greenhouse gas emissions. And I know, as Kenny is going to talk about later, that's where a lot of you may be able to come in when you're making your homes and your businesses more efficient. That is impacting, in a positive way, our greenhouse gas emissions from those sectors. So this is a slide I often use with my students. Um, it's kind of in a word, is the climate crisis, uh, it's serious. And this is, I've actually lost track of which image of which forest fire this happens to be, because there's been quite a few of them uh, in recent history. The other thing is that this is what scientists have been telling us for now for some time. And they keep saying it louder and clearer with every new report. 
And I want to talk just briefly about two recent reports, one from August 2021, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released their sixth assessment report with the latest updates on the science of climate change. And it's not surprising, but it's a fairly stark picture that climate change has already begun and has already caused significant changes to the climate system that we cannot undo. And that report squarely points the finger at human activity and our output of greenhouse gases as the primary cause. This builds on a report from 2018, the Global Warming of One and a Half Degree Celsius report, that implored us to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from all parts of our economy and society um, by up to 50 to 60 percent in the next decade. Now, it was widely reported the world was not going to end in the next 10 years, but this is a decade where things really do matter. Our ability to tackle the climate crisis and actually have a, a climate that we can manage uh, to be livable and functional will depend on the decisions we're making over the next decade. So we've talked about greenhouse gases and their role. What are they doing? Well, they are heating up our, our planet and fairly dramatically. And this is from that recent IPCC report. Um, you can also just, uh, one of the monikers of our, our, our heating over the last uh, little while is that the last, the seven hottest years on record have been the last seven years. And that seems to be something we keep saying almost every year as the, the next year appears to be as warm, if not warmer, than the ones that came before it. And that's an unprecedented amount of warming in the last 2,000 years. And this is definitely has the human signature. This is not about the solar or the volcanic activities as some of these graphs shows. This is about what humans are doing to the planet. Or in other words, the amount of warming we see that's human cause, which is the red bar on this chart, vastly outweighs the amount of warming or cooling that's happening because of solar cycles, natural cycles of solar and volcanic activity. So we are the ones putting all the heat in the atmosphere. And where does it show up? It shows up in the data of our annual temperatures. Globally, temperatures are rising. And we do see here that for most of the United States, it's experiencing significantly warmer temperatures um, compared to the first half of the 1900s, from 1901 to 1960. But what does that look like in Connecticut? Well, in Connecticut, we are seeing that over the last uh, 70 years, and first like Frieda to mention this, our temperature here in Connecticut has risen about three degrees Fahrenheit over the last 70 years, and it's been accelerating since the 1970s. That three degrees Fahrenheit is about one and a half degrees Celsius we're already experiencing here in Connecticut. And my colleague from the public uh, health side of the world will talk a bit about why we should be worried about heat and heat stress and its impact on people. We're also seeing around the world that sea levels are rising across the globe. And globally, it's risen about eight or nine inches uh, since 1880. This rate of sea level rise is also increasing. Again, in most of these graphs, you'll see the, the graph going up, but they will also seem to be getting faster on the way up as we're getting closer and closer to today. Many locations across the United States see high tide flooding three to nine times more frequent than it was just 50 years ago. So this is flooding without storm or rain or, or hurricanes or tornadoes or all the other things that uh, the first selectman mentioned earlier. This is just every month, twice a month, that high tide is now flooding uh, many parts of our communities along our coast, including here in Connecticut. And as, as you can see from this graph, I've brought the, the track of sea level rise here in Long Island Sound. And it turns out that in Long Island Sound, we've seen about 10 inches of sea level rise since about 1940. Is 10 inches a lot? Well, it depends on your perspective. But for those who are living along the coast or near a coastal marsh area or where you're experiencing those flooded high tides, yes, 10 inches is quite a bit. And that is only what we've seen so far some of the work that I did when I was with the state and continues with the Connecticut Institute of Resilience and Climate Adaptation is projecting what is the sea level rise we should expect here in Connecticut by 2050. And for planning purposes, they have suggested that we should expect up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters of sea level rise uh, by 2050. So if you're building a building today, think about that amount of sea level rise that could be coming uh, to us uh, in the next uh, 30 years or so. 
So the seas are rising, the temperatures are rising, so are the temperatures of the water itself. And this is a graph showing global sea surface warming that again has increased and is increasing faster as we get closer and closer today. But I wanted to talk about what's happening here in Connecticut. Our local Long Island Sound waters are warming. For anyone who fishes in Long Island Sound, you've probably started to experience this in the type of fish that you're more or less likely to catch. And so here, my former agency, the Connecticut Deep, has been tracking the temperature of Long Island Sound going back over 30 years. And they've found that in the bottom waters, those cold waters at the bottom of the sound, the changes in temperature in the spring can have up to a three degree swing. It's now three degrees warmer in the spring and about two degrees warmer in the summer. So again, if you're a fish living down there, that is not necessarily the environment that you were used to or that you were anticipating. Uh, when you were uh, coming here to Long Island Sound. And what we're seeing in the surveys of what fish are there, the blue line are the cold water fish are decreasing, so less lobster, less winter flounder. The black line are increasing, so we're seeing more warm water species over time, so more um, summer flounder, sea bass, stripers, spider crabs actually coming up from the mid-Atlantic, displacing some of our other bottom uh, feeding uh, flora and fauna. We're starting to look less like a New England fishery and more like a mid-Atlantic one, more Maryland than Maine today. So the first like we mentioned, we're also getting wetter. And this is a, a look at the country. Most of the country is actually experiencing more extreme heavy precipitation, except for the Southwest. And you've probably heard of the droughts and the fires that are caused by those droughts in the Southwest in California. Again, here in Connecticut, the data how tells a similar story. We're seeing that over the last 70 years, we are getting about an inch more of rain uh, per year every decade. So that otherwise translates back in the 40s, we were used to getting about 42 inches of rain per year. We're now getting about 49 inches of rain per year. And those are the types of things that end up with flooding events in all of our communities. And those flooding events, as the first Leckman alluded to, they're not a gentle rain spread over the course of a month. They're an intense rainstorm where you get four inches, five inches of rain all at once that can overwhelm local infrastructure and lead to local flooding, where we've seen in either extreme storms like Irene and Sandy that cause significant damage. Um, but all of our towns, including here in North Haven, are dealing with those extreme weather events and the damage that they're causing. Uh, another note for our public health related folks, but I can't help myself, beware of floodwaters and they may have within them uh, sewage and pathogens. So be careful when you're out there in floodwaters because many of those rain events overwhelm our sewage treatment plant capacity because that infrastructure wasn't designed for, uh, to handle such heavy loads of rain. So here in Connecticut, we also have the interesting challenge that we have storms that come up from Long Island Sound bringing storm surge and rain that comes down from our river. So we occasionally have an area that's more vulnerable to flooding, including places like North Haven, where the ocean waters or the Long Island Sound waters are meeting the flood waters from the rivers. And that's an extra layer of uh, risk, not directly on the shore, but slightly inland. And that's where we see, and this image is actually down the street from where I lived, where I was in grad school in East Haven on Cozy Beach. Um, these are the types of impacts that we're seeing. Um, the year 2020 saw 22 weather and climate disasters exceeding a billion dollars from droughts and severe storms and cyclones and wildfires and tornadoes. But by the way, our week-long outage in Connecticut from tropical storm Isaias didn't even make the billion dollar list. So these are only ones that achieve that billion dollar price tag. In the first nine months of 2021, there have been 18 billion dollar weather uh, disasters. And there have been over $2 trillion worth of weather related damage as NOAA has been tracking since 1980. So the costs of inaction are, are large and they're rising. And we see that this, uh, is part of our risks here in New England and particularly in Connecticut are from severe storms, heat waves, and flooding. And our electric grid is particularly vulnerable to climate change. And I know California has been in the news and Texas has been in the news, but just know that down the street from us in Bridgeport during um, the superstorm Sandy, one of their key substations that served 52,000 people came within less than about 10 inches 
of being overtopped by seawater, which could have put that community out of power, those 50,000 people out of power, for a month or more had it, they not come down with sandbags and not actually raised their electrical equipment uh, off of the ground into higher ground um, in the middle of the night as the storm was, was arising. And it's, these are the types of images, the experiences with climate change that we're all feeling. And I, I think the first electman spoke eloquently about the, the pain that, that has been causing to us in our communities. And it's showing up in our news feeds. It's showing up on our social media feeds. And this is part of an attitude shift that we're actually seeing at Yale with colleagues who are at the Yale program on climate communication, that more and more people are engaged and alarmed by climate change. Um, that more than half the country are concerned and actually want to get something done. So the direction here is clear, that we must reduce our emissions as much as we can, as fast as we can, in order to avoid fundamentally altering the planet in ways we'll have trouble adapting to. But we also must adapt to the impacts we're already seeing and will continue to see for decades because of the warmth that's already been built into our climate system. So I'm going to close with just two more slides. You'll notice that I do, and our slides will be made available to, to the town as well. Feel free to distribute them. Um, I do like uh, the occasional sort of cartoon about climate change, so hopefully you've been catching a few of those along the way. One of our challenges is our future warming really depends on our choices today, and what I think hopefully, um, if I'm here to bring us down a little bit, uh, Kenny will bring us up at the end of the real things that are happening here in town, the solutions that you can all do together to try to get us on this lower curve where we're having substantial cuts in emissions instead of our current trajectory, unfortunately, as it has been, unfortunately, for the last 20 years, to not do enough to reduce emissions. But it's the types of things that you can do at the local level that is urgent and needed and turns out it's actually good for us, for us all. It'll be good for us from a public health perspective, which my colleague Mauro will talk about in a moment, but it's also good for us because these decisions to deploy clean energy can, uh, can save money, they can create jobs, they can stimulate our economy as well, and those will be things that can be done at the local level, um, which can have dramatic uh, in positive impact uh, on the climate and positive impact on our, our public health and well-being, which is a topic that our next speaker will likely cover. So thank you so much, for Selectman, for having me. Hopefully that gives us a sense of where we are on the science and where we are uh, here in Connecticut on the impacts we're already experiencing. But I will now turn it back to the first Selectman, who will introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much, Rob, for a very interesting presentation. And I think we w would all agree, after knowing what we know now here in North Haven and after hearing Rob's presentation and seeing some of the graphics, how important of an issue this is. So as Rob said, our next speaker is Mr. Mauro Diaz-Hernandez with the Yale Center on Climate Change and Health. Mauro? Thank you, First Selectman Frida, for the introduction and also uh, Mr. Klee for making my job a lot easier. That was a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate you going before me. Um, as has been said, my name is uh, Mauro Diaz-Hernandez. I'm with the Yale Center on Climate Change and Health. And I'm here to discuss climate change and public health, health and public health in Connecticut. So we're going to try to localize the context that uh, Mr. Klee provided. I want to make a very quick acknowledgement to the team that I work with at Yale. Dr. Laura Bosey, who is actually the lead author on uh, the report that I'm about to report on. Um, uh, Drs. Kai Chen, Robert Dubrow, Martin Klein, and Jody Sherman. We are a small but mighty team, and we're here to help and answer questions if anybody has any follow-up that they'd like to do with me. Um, Mr. Klee also mentioned the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, and I do allude to them. They are also wonderful people, um, so please check out their information when you can. I want to start off very quickly with a, snap a snapshot of your community. And you already know this. I pulled this information straight from the North Haven Town website. But I think it's wonderful. I, I, in reading this, um, and with my terrible sense of direction when I showed up and got lost and was wandering around looking for the right building, I really got to, to see the, the, you know, the, the emphasis here is my own, that North Haven, Greater New Haven, really prides itself on school, inviting town centers, 
uh, you note that you're an ideal place to visit and call home, and you really get that sense of community here. And I think that's a wonderful thing, because at the end of the day, we can kind of be a little removed, right? And what are we working towards? And I just want to remind the audience, the, the people um, who are listening, that there are real world implications to what we do or do not do right now. Now, oftentimes when I speak to crowds, um, we have concerns, citizens, parents, grandparents, and I just want to remind you that right now, at this very moment in time, what we do or choose not to do, as Mr. Klee has shown with the, the different maps, is going to determine not only what happens to us, but also the world that your children and your grandchildren will be inheriting. So keep that in mind as we move forward. I want to point out something very specific to North Haven. However, this is some data from our friends at the Yale Program on Climate uh, Change Communications uh, about New Haven County. And you can see that there are a lot of concerned people uh, in New Haven. They're worried about global warming. They're worried that it's already harming people. But most of all, I just want to highlight that, that second uh, red box that you see uh, on the presentation that a lot of people are worried what's going to happen to future generations. I think it says a lot about our audience who are tuning in and want to learn more about this because, again, what we do or do not do decides what our future generations get. Mr. Klee did a really good explanation of, of these warming projections. Um, you can see that our current policies are going to lead to a lot of warming. And obviously, we would like to limit that as much as possible for a variety of reasons, as we're already outlined, but also for what you're about to see and hear. And I want to make a very quick note about um, the way climate change harms people. Climate change does not harm people equally. Climate change is a, a, a threat multiplier. There are certain communities, usually communities of color, children, older adults, adults and lower income communities that suffer what's first and worst, right? They experience it usually due to their uh, proximity to um, coastlines, housing, different areas that probably are not as well kept up um, as other communities. And also children, um, one of my professors would always tell us, you know, children are not just small adults, right? Children experience health impacts in a variety of ways that are much different than what adults do. So very nice, pretty slide. But I'm going to move into the bulk of what I'm here to talk about. This is the Climate Change and Health in Connecticut report that just came out last year. Again, the lead authors, Drs. Bosey and Dubrow. What we did was we looked at 19 different indicators and tracked how are those going to be affected by a changing climate in Connecticut? Why don't we start in? Another very quick note that uh, Mr. Klee had also mentioned, um, the research that's being done by our friends over at CERCA, Yukon CERCA. Um, we can expect to see, if we don't change what we're doing, <laughs> um, a five degree increase in annual average temperature by the end of the century an increase in annual precipitation, greater flood risk, extreme droughts, and our warm spell days increasing from less than three per year in the 1950s to about 120 or so by 2100. That's a third of the year that uh, could be effect affected by warm spell days in Connecticut, and that is a major change. So we're going to go into the specific indicators that I came here to talk about. And the first one is temperature. Annual average temperature has increased by about 3 degrees Fahrenheit in a period of about 120 years. And what does this mean specific for health? There will, or there is rather a, an increase in heat-related illness that we see with hospital admissions, ER visits that happen during warm months. We can expect amplified ozone or smog as um, it's also called warmer temperatures also mean that mosquitoes and ticks besides being just a minor annoyance during the summer um, have huge health effects because of the diseases that they may carry 
And then for allergy sufferers, a longer and uh, earlier ragweed pollen season that just makes it a little bit more difficult to breathe. A quick note on heat-related illness. Um, again, the idea that climate change does not affect people equally, right? A lot of uh, specific populations are at greater risk of suffering from heat-related illnesses, and you can see the uh, different uh, populations of interest, the elderly, young children, outdoor workers, athletes, pregnant women. So there's a lot that can be stratified um, in this particular um, heat-related illness effects. So what can we do? Um, Kenny is going to talk a lot about how some of the things that are being done here in North Haven and around Connecticut can actually help with this, but I also want to draw attention that our center produces specific issue briefs, and we have one on extreme heat, so if anybody wants to read that, please feel free to do so. From the policy side, we can make homes cooler, more energy efficient, powered by renewable energy, because that will help keep the greenhouse gas emissions down, which, as Mr. Klee had mentioned earlier, will help keep warming down. You can support urban tree planting initiatives. Um, you can protect against heat-related illnesses at work sites, so OSHA coming in and assisting with making sure that outdoor workers are protected, and also with your sports teams. Uh, from the policy perspective, I also like to move into the personal actions. So what can you do? In moments of uh, heat, really, I'm sorry, uh, high heat, check on your neighbors. It says check on your elderly neighbors, of course, but check on your neighbors anyways. It's always a good community move. And if you can, cool your community and your neighborhood down with tree plantings and cool roofs, which are efforts to try to use lighter colored roofing materials that actually reflect more sunlight that make um, your homes a little cooler. We're moving on to extreme events, and I'll be honest, uh, Mr. Klee may, uh, I don't know if he experiences this, I have trouble keeping up, updating the slide. <laughs> you know, there, there's always, as we're hearing and seeing, more and more disasters, weather disasters happening. And these are just some that occurred in Connecticut. So what should we worry about? There's direct dangers from drowning, disruptions to critical infrastructure, as was mentioned, the uh, energy, the, the substations, um, roads being washed out, which then cause, you know, how do emergency vehicles get to the people in, in need? Um, mental health impacts, um, the effects of climate change that you can't really see, right? The, the mental health impacts, and it's been shown that people who go through extreme weather events or weather disasters suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, anxiety rates are much higher in children who go through that. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there from the mental health side. And then of course the structural inequality across communities as was alluded to earlier in the slide regarding how certain communities are hurt first and worst. Everybody is familiar with Superstorm Sandy. Um, if you were in the state, you probably were affected by it or knew somebody who was. This map that's on the screen right now shows uh, Sandy storm surge. And oftentimes when we talk about flooding and surge, it's very easy to think of it as just being, you know, by the ocean. I'm not by the ocean, you know, the, the flooding won't affect me. But of course, you have to remember all of the waterways that lead into the ocean, again, as, as my colleague alluded to. And there's another phrase, I feel like we come up with a lot of phrases in our work, that today's flood is going to become tomorrow's high tide. So every time you see this extreme flooding, just imagine years from now, that's probably going to be our normal. We covered high tide flooding. Um, a bit in our previous presentation, but what does that mean again for health? Uh, it was alluded to the, the raw sewage that could inundate our, our systems, or, and then people can be exposed to it. Uh, transmission of certain bacteria like Vibrio infections and the contamination of different drinking water sources. Now I believe I took out this slide, but there's also a special attention that needs to be paid to the Superfund sites in Connecticut. 
there are 16 Superfund sites, and of those, seven of those are um, susceptible to the, these climactic changes and washing out of critical infrastructure. So what do we do for extreme weather events? Believe it or not, our center also has another uh, policy brief or issue brief about extreme events. Please check it out. From the policy side, we can make housing more affordable. We can uh, begin uh, or relooking at emergency planning, backup power in different communities. And from the personal side, know your risk, right? If you live near the ocean, make sure that, or near a waterway, know that how to get out if you need to, right? Make a plan. We're gonna go very quickly through this next part, um, um, infectious diseases. Warming weather is good for a lot of different um, vectors that can transmit different diseases. Mosquitoes are one of them, and the research shows that of the 28 species that we have here in Connecticut, 10 of those show uh, increasing abundance. Luckily, three of them show decreasing abundance, but the also important part here is that 10 show increasing. Of those that are increasing, those are the mosquitoes that specifically carry the infections listed on screen, uh, triple E, Tritovirus and West Nile virus. So again, something that we need to monitor. Good news is that tick-borne illnesses, as you can see um, on this particular graph, we've been seeing that Lyme disease cases are actually going down. Um, at the same time, though, paradoxically, as ticks are becoming more and more abundant, that could be because we've gotten a lot better at detecting it and, and catching it. Um, another threat to consider are Lone Star ticks that are now expanding into Connecticut and give you all of those things that you see on screen. The red meat allergy, I think, has been making its, its way in the news right now, um, and that's the tick that's associated with that. We spoke about the increasing in foodborne Vibrio infections because the surface water temperatures are getting a little warmer in Connecticut. So again, what do we do from the policy side? surveillance of these new vectors, the mosquitoes, the ticks, and their diseases, public education on what it means to actually look out for these um, particular infections, um, and what can you do in your own home? Create a tick-safe zone in yard, um, tick-safe and mosquito-safe. Practice your own personal uh, protection practices, making sure that you're not bitten uh, by ticks or mosquitoes in the summertime. And then also with mosquitoes, high quality housing, making sure that uh, you find a way to keep them out of your own house. Air quality, I'm happy to report there is good news, and I apologize, these slides look a little uh, pixelated, but you can see that ground level ozone smog days are actually decreasing across all of the counties in Connecticut. That's good, they're decreasing, but they're not zero. One of the other items that we're looking at is the increase in particular arrow allergens, mold and pollen, especially outdoor mold. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, ragweed pollen is also a big uh, issue or item of concern. What can you do to assist with the air quality issues uh, luckily, Kenny's going to talk a lot more about these particular, how can you assist with the switch over to renewable energies that will affect all of these big policy decisions, electrifying transportation, committing to net zero carbon emissions, um, limiting interstate pollution. And then, of course, from the personal side, you can also look into um, signing up for energy audits, which I believe Kenny will be, will be speaking about. Uh, opting in for renewable energies and electrifying where and when you can. So thank you all for listening. And I just want to say on a personal note, I'm originally from Texas and I have a lot of family in Louisiana. And I think it's always inspiring to be in a room with people that they call movers, shakers, and change makers. So I'm really happy to be here speaking with all of you and of course to the community as well. And I'm certain you care about these issues and you will be doing something about them. If interested, please feel free to reach out. And I'll also invite you, if you wanna learn more about what these issues look like on the global scale, to join our center on Thursday, November 18th. 
um, to hear about the major landmark Lancet report that was just published um, that we base our report structure on. Um, hopefully the link will be live when these things are passed out. But that is my time, and I thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Morrow. That was an outstanding presentation also. And uh, with uh, Mr. Klee, Mr. Diaz-Hernandez, we saw two outstanding presentations fold into each other in a very provocative fashion. We saw Mr. Klee's overview and how it relates to storms, temperature change, intensity of storms, and then Mr. Diaz-Hernandez spoke about how even there are greater impacts in terms of airborne allergens, mosquitoes, ticks. And in many other municipalities across the country, there's even more of a rodent infest, uh, infesting because of what's happening. New York City, as an example, is a perfect example of that. So as we now move forward from the presentations and the problems and the analysis and the tremendous data that we just saw here, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kenny Foscu, North Haven's own chairman of our Clean Energy Task Force. Kenny. Mike, thank you so much uh, for sponsoring this and, and to the town. And thanks, Rob and Morrow. And uh, I'm a lifelong public health person, so I really appreciate your both of your work, but especially that. Um, and as they said, they, had to t they got to talk about the not so good stuff. I get to talk about the good stuff, so to speak. So um, again, my name is Kenny Foscu, and I chair the town's clean energy task force. Our task force was appointed by the town of North Haven as part of Connecticut, the Connecticut Clean Energy Funds Clean Energy Communities Program, and we were founded in 2007. Um, and there were over 60 clean energy task forces and commissions around the state. So a lot of people are working on this issue. Um, and I want to, before I forget, I just want to say, um, and I think Rob kind of alluded to this, North Haven is on the map in terms of being a leader in clean energy and energy uh, efficiency. Um, and, and it's well known among these 60 task forces. We have a really good reputation. And there, there's two reasons. One is Mike's leadership as the first selectman and our collaboration between the town and our, and our task force. And one of the things that we do um, that's really over the years has made a lot of difference is we meet quarterly. And I think we might be the only task force that does that. So thank you so much. Um, so let me get started here. Excuse me. So our objectives, um, first, uh, to encourage energy efficient, uh, ener efficient energy use by town officials, households, and businesses. We want to promote the use of clean energy, uh, clean renewable energy sources. Uh, really work to save money for the, the town government, residences, and businesses, because a lot about this is, the good part is, you save money doing these things. And we want to involve uh, North Haven residents, and this is a good venue for doing this, to really get the word out. And we're always wanting to recruit new task force members, especially now. So, so clearly, as Rob and Morrow talked about, um, we got a problem. It's really a crisis. Um, our children deserve as much work and grandchildren. This is not just about today, this is about the future. And we really need to work together to slow down the, the already devastating effects of climate change. And the main thing we need to do is to move to a clean energy economy as soon as possible and away from fossil fuels. This is caused by humans, as Rob did a great job talking about. And so most, most of my presentation will be uh, focusing on saving money and things that you can do, and especially in the home. This is for residences. And hopefully it'll be news that you can use. So I think everybody knows by now, these are not no longer options. We can't stick our head in the ground like an ostrich. And my favorite Southern, I think this is a Southern thing about whistling past the graveyard. 
you know, thinking it's going to be all right, you know, that's, it's not, that's no longer an option. But first of all, I did want to talk about some of the town's many projects and accomplishments. Um, and I'll, uh, we've done lots of things, but I just want to uh, focus on a few things. Um, I think most people in, in uh, North Haven are very aware of the, of the, uh, the solar array on the landfill. Um, we re recently, in the last couple of years, we increased the uh, number of solar panels to the array. And this array generates almost a megawatt of power now, and it's used to cover the cost of the power to run the, uh, to the town's water treatment plant, which is the largest municipal electri user of electricity. So that's a big thing in terms of saving money for the town. Um, and just so people know, they won't, the town does not have to put any money in this. Uh, it's uh, another one of what, what are called power purchase agreements, which is the way a lot of this is funded. And the Green Skies Company gets uh, repaid through the selling of power back to UI. Um, probably the first thing that we originally focused on when we got started was the Clean Ener Energy Option Campaign. And this was a program in which uh, residences and businesses could voluntarily purchase uh, clean energy through their local electricity utilities. You would sign up through a card. And the purpose is really to increase local and statewide usage of clean energy renewal. So we raised the number of people saying, I want my power to, be, to come from clean energy sources. And hundreds of North Haven's uh, residents signed up for that. And uh, in 2011, we had enough people sign up and enough points, because we gather points from the state, and that we won a free solar array that we put on the high school. So that, and that work is a part of, um, I, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot about this, but we've had a multi-year partnership with the Project Green Kids at the high school and the teacher there. Um, the main emphasis that we've talked about that um, Rob and Morrow mentioned is the whole uh, program called the Home Energy Solutions Energy Assessments or any audits we like to use assessments. It's not all it sounds like a tax thing, but um, and uh, so we've been working for several years with the town with town uh, re residents to uh, get them to sign up and have uh, energy assessments done. And at this point, I think we're uh, at least over 30 percent of the, p the, t the residents in North Haven have signed up at least for one. Some people have had multiple ones. Uh, and, and also made energy improvements that come from these audits or uh, assessments. So I'll be talking a little bit more in a minute about what HES are and how important it is, but uh, I should want to say that we've done three very successful campaigns. In 2014, we had a six month long, really high, a successful uh, campaign in conjunction with the town and with the two contractors. Over 500 North Haven residents took advantage of the campaign and we had a kind of a, a, a donation system where uh, people, uh, the vendors would make a $25 donation for each assessment to a, a town um, a charitable, a charitable uh, group and we, as you remember in our picture, Mike, we gave a check of over $12,000 uh, to Sarah, which is a, a local disability thing. We, we found that that's a really good way to get people involved with this. In 2017, we used $30,000 in grants to give out uh, 300, uh, 300 more free assessments. And we just finished our third campaign where over 250 uh, residents uh, had uh, assessments and the vendors or the contractors uh, donated over $6,000 to the North Haven Congregational Church food pantry, which really fit with what's going on during COVID. And also want to say thank you to all those that signed up during a horrible pandemic where, you know, people were afraid to have people come into their homes. So um, we've, we've conducted two uh, successful solarized campaigns, which basically encouraging uh, residents to sign up and get solar, uh, residential solar. Um, 
I won't say a whole lot about this, but we, uh, we work with a vendor and they came out with a discounted price. So, you know, what would be a $24,000 um, solar array was uh, averaged out to be more like 14,000. And so with the, all the different credits and rebates, uh, it was really great. Um, about 50 homeowners participated in those two programs. But one of the things that came out of this that we believe is a lot of other solar companies said, wait, we're gonna piggyback on all that publicity you were doing. And so there was a lot of door to door from different companies. And um, as of 2019, over uh, about uh, North Haven had over uh, 500 solar installations on residents. And I believe with the last time I looked at the data, it was closer to 700. So our work paid off more than just 50, I believe. So, um, so the town, um, a few years ago, the town signed a performance contract, which is another way of financing these programs with the Johnson Controls Company to do energy efficiency updates, upgrades in town buildings. And the company did over $6 million worth of work in schools and the town buildings, replacing boilers, heating systems, and doing other retrofitting upgrades that have saved the towns hundreds of thousands of dollars. And according to the terms of the performance contract, so the town does not put out the money. The town, uh, the company gets repaid based on the savings that they did. So if they don't, if their savings don't work, they don't get paid. So there's a lot of uh, encouragement to, to do good work. And I found out uh, in a recent fiscal year, fiscal year, we saved over $400,000 in energy costs that particular year. Um, so the check, you see uh, Mike with this check, um, for over $800,000 from UI. This was kind of a reward, reward for energy, energy saving incentives that the town has undertaken because there's several more things in this that have happened. Um, and it was particularly for this performance contract. And that's something a lot of towns, I think, have looked at since that time. Um, so these are just a few of the many town and task force collaborative projects. And you can find out more on our webpage on the town website so there are really two important principles that people talk about when we talk about how do we respond to this and the, our favorite my favorite one is really the first one is energy efficiency that's really I call it the first commandment of dealing with this problem you know and that's because the cleanest energy cheapest energy is the energy you don't use so it, we, you know, we talk about solar and things and all that. It's really important, but the first step always is making your building as uh, energy efficient as possible. And the other thing is when we think about getting away from fossil fuels, everything has to be electrified. E electrify everything, right? <laughs> so, so um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I'm really going to focus on homes and what residents can do. And um, my friends talked about this. And um, so just this is a quick overview of typical home improvements. Um, and I'll go get into some of these uh, in more detail. Sealing air leaks and adding insulation. Improving heating and cooling systems. Sealing duct work. Replacing windows upgrading lighting appliances and water heating equipment and, and installing renewable energy systems and a major reason for doing that is and a focus on buildings we talked about the different sources of, of carbon emissions the energy information administration says that the U u.s residential sector accounts for 21 percent of all energy consumption and is responsible for 20% of a country's carbon emissions, which is, Rob mentioned that earlier. So it's really important. And um, a lot of this is fairly straightforward stuff. It's not that really that complicated. So I mentioned the home energy solutions, uh, energy uh, assessments earlier. Um, a lot of people out there, as I said, know about this and have done this. And we thank you very much for doing, you know, for doing this. Um, but basically, trained um, contractors, technicians come in, 
They do a before and after measurement of, of airflow. Um, there's more loss of air before and it's tighter when they finish. And so they do things like install energy saving uh, light LED bulbs, which people may know this, but LED light bulbs use up to 80% less energy than regular light bulbs. And they last 20 times, uh, 25 times longer. And I think I saw some data that nationally, this is a would make it, if everybody had LED bulbs, it would be, it would really have a major impact on energy use. Also, uh, water saving shower heads. Um, the, a big thing they do, and I've had two of these, and I can't tell you how, how great they were. They provide weatherization, they go around, they seal every crack in your house, and it sounds kind of like wouldn't make much difference, but I can tell you my house is so much more um, energy efficient, and I, I like to tell people I'm more comfortable in my retirement because I've slashed my energy costs and utility costs. So. They also make rep recommendations uh, on deeper measures, uh, insulation, um, air conditioning, heating upgrades, and air source heat pumps, which I'm going to talk about in, in, in a little bit. And they actually hand out um, rebate coupons for energy saving uh, products. So at this point, um, it's, it's a $50 copay by the customer, but in return, you receive over a thousand dollars in materials and labor and what happened when the two that i've done three three or four people show up and they spend about three hours there working and they're not sitting around so you can you get a lot for this fifty dollars um, and if you want to find out more you can call the number on the screen so insulation i call it the gift that keeps on giving you know once you do this it is for the life of the house, you're, uh, you're, you continue sa saving energy. Um, so Energy Energize Connecticut, um, which is through the utilities, has rebates at this point up to $1.70 per square foot on approved insulation pro uh, projects, which um, according to the companies and um, UI and uh, Energize Connecticut, it would cover about three, four, three quarters of the cost of almost any insulation project. So this makes that very affordable. It was a, a little bit higher, but they've cut it back a little bit. So, um, so and also if you're planning to um, prioritize an insulation project, um, don't do what I did, which was the reverse of this. You start with the attic, then you go to the basement, and then you, make sure your walls are insulated and then you do the windows way back i didn't know any better i started with the windows but um and a, a very smart person taught me that so. heat pumps okay this is this is where we have to go with heating and cooling and a lot of people have, have started this uh, going this direction there are two types um, air source and ground source we focus on air source because it's really a lot more uh, manageable financially. Uh, ground source is really good, but it's very expensive. Uh, and so um, air source heat pump works by collecting heat energy and moving heat indoors in the winter and outdoors in the summer. And they're extremely energy efficient. I have uh, one that, uh, that I use mostly to cool my downstairs. Um, it's uh, very, much more efficient than your uh, conventional heating and air conditioning, and it gives you a little more pre uh, precise uh, temperature control. And the big thing is they're powered by electricity. Electrify everything, right? And not fossil fuels. Um, and an electric heat pump transfers energy 50% more efficiently than your conventional heating and air conditioning system. So, um, we're talking about doing a, a campaign around heat pumps like the uh, HES one. Um, and um, we're thinking that a lot of people are probably thinking about uh, putting in air conditioning. Um, we want people to use it for heat too, but we, um, a couple, some people have recommended that we focus on that. And from my experience, so I have, I have one that cools my downstairs. 
I never turn on the cooling part. All I turn on is the dehumidification, and my house is cold. I mean, it's amazing, you know. Um, and now I use it for auxiliary heat also, so. So, um, Energized Connecticut at this point has up to $15,000 in incentives. So this would be if you were gonna put in a whole house system. Some people like myself, I put in part of it. But um, it's, uh, it's so efficient, it's amazing. So take a look at it. We also, there's also heat pump water heaters uh, on the market now. They're twice as efficient as most energy as uh, most water heater systems on the market um, they are 25 to 50 percent savings on electric water heating cost uh, they, they're programmable for like a, a vacation mode when you're away and the big thing is uh, there's if you uh, approach a company they can um, you can be it could be financed by a 750 dollar instant discount right away off the top of this um, and it seems I, I looked into this I have gas uh, uh, gas uh, water heating but if it, it, it seemed like it was more cost effective if you have an electric water heater now to go from ele electric water heater to a heat pump a water heater um, okay so I think most people know about residential solar. Um, like I said, a lot of people in Connecticut uh, and in North Haven has gone to that, but just a, a quick overview f for people uh, and on how it works. So the solar panels turn the sun's photons into direct current electricity. Um, the inverter, which is part of the system, then turns the DC current into alternating current, which is what we use in our ho homes. Um, and then solar power is used first and if there's not enough and say it's at night, then the power, the, uh, the power from the grid that you were hooked up to takes over from there. And the um, alternating power, uh, AC power that you don't use is sent back into the grid to, to, uh, to the grid to be used by other consumers and you get credit for that. And I'll allude to that in a second. So why should you install solar if you can? A lot of us can. But, uh, talk about that um, it's proven its technology it's been around for years now it's a lot it's a lot cheaper and, and the quality has gone a lot gone up a lot the current uh, solar technology has a lifespan of about 25 years um, and there's over a hundred contractors in Connecticut now so you can imagine and I think there's over 2,000 people working in this in this uh, area at this point so it's a lot easier to go uh, solar. And obviously, it's clean and free fuel. The sun is free, right? Um, very affordable. You can either purchase or lease it. Um, as I mentioned, the costs have really gone down and the quality has gone up. Um, there, there has been state incentives, but just this past week, there are some changes that are gonna go into effect in January. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> the solar guys I've talked to are still working on that. So uh, the best thing to do if you want to proceed with getting solar is to talk to them about that. If you purchase it, you, uh, you, you are eligible for a federal in investment tax credit of about 26%, so, but not if you lease it. So. so now we have solar batteries. That's been a discussion for some time. Um, there's a lot of on the market. Um, these are rechargeable, and as my uh, colleague who just recently installed one of these on her house, they're actually neutral in terms of the source of electricity. So, you know, most people are going to hook it up if they have a solar, you know, array. But you're also it's also hooked up to the grid, so you can also recharge your battery that way. Um, and it's a very good alternative to uh, natural gas and diesel generators. So a lot of people are looking into Generac and things like that. Um, and it's really a, a better alternative if you're, if you're able to do it because they're silent, uh, they're non-polluting, and, and they can be installed inside your garage or home. And there's not the danger of carbon monoxide with these other ones. 
And obviously, we've talked a lot about the weather and the changes. They're going to provide some backup during the storm, uh, during the storms and the out winter outages. And um, there's financing available for the, from the Connecticut Green Bank. I don't know all the details, but you can contact them. And so, again, the question is, can I go off the grid with solar panels? So that's a good uh, reason to look in it, into it, especially if you have a solar. So my last area, and definitely not least, as Rob mentioned earlier, in Connecticut, you know, 40 percent of greenhouse gases and emi greenhouse gas emissions are from the transportation sector. That's twice every other sector. So this is really important. Um, and um, so we, I think people are aware of EVs. Everybody's probably seen Teslas, maybe a few other kinds. Um, it's a proven technology. Um, I guess the biggest thing, as my colleague who has one pointed out, uh, the operating cost or very low. Um, you don't have to change your oil. You don't have to do oil filters, spark plugs, air filters, um, no radiator, all the type of things that um, we're used to as car owners. And the maintenance costs are about $500 per year less than a conventional car. So it's really something to look at. And if, if you've been watching the news, you see that GM is going to go totally to EV. So that's a pretty big endorsement, I would say. Uh, other uh, GM, Ford, Nissan, Volkswagen, Volvos, they're rapidly expanding their offerings. And several will be, will be all electric in 10 years. So it's really something to look at. And for my money or my interest, because I have a hybrid, I've been afraid to go to EV because of the range fear. Um, the new infrastructure bill that just passed this past week uh, will lead to about 500,000 uh, um, charging stations be installed around the country. So that that's a game changer. That's definitely a game changer. So, so I just want to make two final points. I think about this. We think about this a lot. Um, Mike has made me think about that. He's a person who's very interested in economic development. That addressing climate change can be a positive investment in jobs and business and, and also tax, tax revenue because of the job generation. And it's real economic development. So people should think in those terms also besides the public health issues and you know the environmental crisis that we're in. There is a way out of this that's really benefits and my kind of a joke I have is uh, climate change is a business opportunity so because it's it, it is jobs but it's also businesses because we're seeing who is doing the work it's the private sector uh, all these companies and I I think over 34,000 uh, people are working in doing the home energy assessments in Connecticut or at least they were and I think uh, uh, way over 2,000 are um, Doing solar and no telling how many in some of these other sectors, um, so it's really it's really a, a good thing. And the other thing is, people really should be contacting the state and federal policymakers to make this a much higher priority. It's clear that we have to 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 step up, and Connecticut is behind a lot of New England in terms of some of the advancing these programs. So uh, we, the, the task force meets every uh, second Monday of the week. We meet in the Recreation Center. People are definitely welcome, and we're really looking for new members. I mentioned er earlier that we want to really think about doing a serious um, heat pump campaign, and, but it, it takes some t uh, folks to do that. And here's some uh, information uh, about contacting. And I'm sorry we can't do questions, but if, uh, I would say if people see this out there and they have questions about this, they can contact the First Selectman's Office and our task force. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much, Kenny, for a recap of some of the things that the Clean Energy Task Force and the Town of North Haven have accomplished. And uh, I wanted to just mention, Kenny said something very interesting about economic development. As many of you know, I have an active role in every project in town. And when we work with developers, 
specifically companies like National Realty and uh, the plaza owner where the Starbucks is, we often talk about the opportunities of EV charging stations. And uh, just about a week and a half ago, I met with the owners of the plaza where the Starbucks is, where we just brought a Jersey Mike's in, and there are several new charging stations there, EV charging stations. So they listened to some of the things we asked for over at National Realty, uh, where the New Mexican restaurant is, uh, just east of where the Wendy's is. We worked with them years ago to put in six EV charging stations, and there might be eight there as we are today, as we sit today. The economic development aspect, as Kenny mentioned, of solar creates great jobs. As Kenny knows, we partnered with Gateway years ago. As Gateway was introducing a program to have people be trained on solar installations, and the job creation as a result of that was fabulous uh, over the course of uh, that time period here in North Haven and across the region. So in conclusion, I wanted to thank Mr. Rob Klee Mr. Moro Diaz Hernandez and Mr. Kenny Foscu for three outstanding presentations. And I hope you will remember a lot about what you saw today. The slides will be made available, as Rob mentioned earlier. And coming back to Kenny's last few comments, out of 169 cities and towns, there are 60 clean energy task forces. I've talked to other mayors who knew nothing about what a clean energy task force is or what they do. And our Clean Energy Task Force, as Kenny mentions, meets at the designated time and meets with me in my office once a quarter as we continue to try to bring new and exciting projects to North Haven that increase the overall energy usage efficiency. And in closing, I'd like to say this. Never think, ladies and gentlemen, that you as a homeowner cannot make an impact on some of the things we saw today, on some of the problems that exist in today's society all across the country. Because although the temperature has risen 1.5 degrees Celsius and 3 degrees Fahrenheit, we still have an ability to make an impact to prevent the temperature from rising in the future by doing some of the things that you can do as homeowners, some of the things that were presented here today in an effort to keep us safe from future storms and rest assured that this government will do everything we can in the perpetuation of public safety and health safety for our residents. I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank our guests here this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. The preceding program is brought to you in part through a grant from the town of North Haven. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at NHTV.com.